Um, at the end of the session, hopefully you all will sign up for a free open access account to the Learning Resource Center. Um, and you can use all of these interactive links to access the resources. So let's recap part one. We can uh, advance the slides, thank you. So part one, we did screening and early treatment, initial resuscitation, main arterial pressure, admission to intensive care, infection and source control and hemodynamic management. So we're gonna start with part two now. We're gonna talk about ventilation, additional therapies, long-term outcomes and goals of care. So we'll go ahead and refresh our memories about what's happening with Mr. G. He's a 66 year old male. He has no past medical history, except he um, had some hypertension for which he was not taking his medications. He presented in septic shock associated with abdominal pain and diarrhea. We've given him intravenous fluids, antibiotics. We've sent several investigations to the lab. He's on oxygen, a high level of oxygen, 15 liters per minute by reservoir bag and vasopressors. The CT abdomen pelvis was consistent with diarrheal illness, but did not demonstrate abscess or any other surgical indication. So the update is that the ICU nurse calls you because Mr. G has emesis with a large volume of bilious liquid and he's short of breath. So he's on the 15 liters per minute of oxygen by non-rebreather mask or reservoir bag. The nurse also tells you that the lab called and reported additional investigation uh, data. You ask for a repeat chest X-ray to be performed at the bedside and you arrive in the ICU to find him on 15 liters, short of breath, ill appearing with increased work of breathing. He's awake and responsive, but he can only talk to you in two to three, um, or sorry, three to four word sentences. His noradrenaline infusion is at 0 0.8 micrograms per kilogram per minute, and his vasopressin is infusing at 0 0.03 units per minute. His respiratory rate is elevated at 34. His heart rate is elevated at 122. Blood pressure is 100 over 62, and his SpO2 is 91, despite being on 15 liters per minute. The full blood count has returned with white cells of 22, hemoglobin 8.4, hematocrit 25 and a half, platelets 199. His electrolytes show sodium is normal, potassium is normal, chloride is normal. His CO2 or bicarbonate is 18, which is low. And then the BUN and serum creatinine are 34 and 180. Transaminases are 63 and 24. PT is 13 with an INR of 1.0. Chest X-ray does not show a pneumothorax. He does have bilateral opacities and small effusions with compressive atelectasis, but no other large findings. His blood culture is showing gram-negative bacilli, his respiratory culture is pending, and the urine culture is not processed because they have a normal urinalysis result, okay, so no urinary infection. Okay, so I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Francois to talk about the first section, which is ventilation, and read the objectives for learning. All right, so our objectives for the ventilation discussion is uh, at the end of this, we should be able to understand the risks and benefits of hypoxia from excess FiO2 delivery, choose appropriate oxygen delivery device for acute hypoxemia, calculate the appropriate tidal volume for any patient, define acute respiratory distress syndrome, recite, the acceptable upper limit for plateau pressures. Describe the difference between peak inspiratory pressure and plateau pressure. Describe recruitment maneuvers and decide when they should be used. Describe when prone positioning is employed for mechanically ventilated patients. Recite the recommended duration for prone position. Appropriately prescribe a neuromuscular blockade agent for patients with sepsis-induced 
acute respiratory distress syndrome, understand the venovenous uh, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation is when it's indicated for patient with sepsis induced acute respiratory distress. Next. So um, this will move us to the next question. So Mr. G's, SPO2 is now 88% on 15 liters uh, per minute by non libriver facial mask. What is the most appropriate next step? So would you intubate and put him on mechanical ventilation? Would you refer him for ECMO? Would you give him a blood transfusion? Would you start high flow oxygen therapy or is no intervention needed at this time? Okay, we have one answer from in person advocating for immediate intubation. Anyone else? Is there any other way? Sorry. Is there any other way you can use to help this patient without intubation? So D, high flow oxygen therapy. Yes. Any other answer? Seems that from the pool we are having A, which is 44%, and D, which is 56%. Which is similar to the in-person audience. Yeah. So we can stop sharing this question and then we'll go to the next recommendations, which will help us find the answer. All right. So patients who are undergoing mechanical ventilation in the ICU uh, often- oh, hold on, hold on. Sorry, that recommendation is for, is for the next one. So the answer to, to the question is dependent upon your resources. So when you have lower flow, non-invasive oxygen therapy, 15 liters per minute on a non-rebreather mask is the most oxygen you can give for low flow devices, isn't it? So you either have to move to high flow oxygen therapy, which is the recommendation because it, we have found that it actually can pre help prevent intubation. Um, or if that's unavailable, then you probably are going to have to intubate. Okay, so A and D is the split answer, and that, that's, that's absolutely uh, correct. It really depends on, on your setting. Okay. So the next recommendation, number 46, says there's insufficient evidence to make a recommendation on the use of conservative oxygen targets in adults with sepsis-induced hypoxemic uh, failure. So if we go up just a little bit to look at the recommend the, the quote, patients who are undergoing mechanical ventilation in the ICU often receive a high FiO2 or high oxygen ins uh, inspiration and have high arterial oxygen tension. The conservative use of oxygen may reduce oxygen exposure and diminish lung and systemic um, oxidative injury. The evidence for the use of conservative oxygen targets and therapy in patients with sepsis is limited. So the recommendation is not to have SpO2 down to 88% is basically what they're saying there. Okay. Yeah, next question. Yeah, our next question is, which one of the following is a potential complication with excess FIO2 delivery, so A, the oxidative injury to lung, B, systemic oxidative injury, C, vasoconstruction, D, cellular apoptosis, then E, all of the above. E, from the audience, do we have some answers? All right, it seems that from the pool, we are having almost eight, six, which goes, they are going for E, only 13%, A, Anna. Good, so if we click on this question, it will take us to an article that has a very nice picture um, of the complications of giving too much oxygen. So we know if we have low amounts of oxygen, so the curve to the left, 
you have hypoxemia, you have an adrenergic response, and you can have pulmonary hypertension. So that's from having lower levels of oxygen. But if you look at the curve to the right, you can see that there's also complications from giving too much oxygen. So that's pulmonary damage from oxidative damage, apoptosis, oxidative stress, and vasoconstriction. So with that in mind, you really want to target um, the, the best SpO2 you can get for septic shock. It's around 94 to 95% for the lowest amount of inspired oxygen. So if you can wean your oxygen down, try to do that. Don't just leave it at 100%. Okay, we can go back to the LRC. Oops, All right. I just gave you this answer. All right, so... Um... Although there, there may be a lack of clear evidence and consensus, which one of the following oxygen goals is recommended for adult patients with septic shock according to WFSA, NSCA, and light box? Mm -hmm. So we have uh, A, which is SPO2 more than 88%, um, B, PO2 more than 45 millimeter of mercury, C, SPO2 equals to 90%. Two to nine, uh, ninety-five percent. Then D is equal to more than uh, ninety-four percent. So, from the audience, some people are saying D. Others C. It looks very mixed. Yeah, mixed. Mixed responses. Yeah, interesting. So the answer is? The answer is D. Yes. So can you <laughs> Yeah, so <laughs> we, can, we can click on the question yeah. and then scroll to um, the resource. A G? Oh, uh, it's, it's Alana. That's fine, Alana. Oh, Just go Alana. back to LRC, yes. apologies. So the recommendation, so during, so during COVID and the pandemic, there was a lot of distress because patients were very hypoxemic. And so a lot of people were asking how much oxygen should we give? What SpO2 should we tolerate? And so around the, around the entire globe, there was a consensus, um, especially for, for settings that had resource limitations, so they don't have high flow oxygen, et cetera. And they came up with some guidelines. And essentially for people in septic shock, they recommend an SpO2 of at least 94%. For pregnant patients, it's at least 95%. Okay, so an SpO2 greater than 88%, which is option A, is too low, okay? B, a PaO2 greater than 45 was not the question. And then SpO2 92 to 95% was not the question. So the, the answer is greater than 94% in patients in septic shock, okay? And that's because they have increased oxygen demand and they have compromised perfusion to the cells, isn't it? So you wanna make sure you have ample um, oxygenation. So the next question, Brendan. Brendan. Dr. Adam. Yes. If the patient has ARDS, do you change those goals or use the same goals? That's an excellent question. We don't have um, great recommendations on the actual SpO2 around ARDS. Um, my goal in ARDS would probably be above 90% um, if possible. Um, I actually am thinking a bit more in ARDS, and we can talk about this in a minute. I'm thinking more about getting my FiO2 down because I'm concerned about oxidative injury to the lungs. Um, so yeah, we can certainly talk about that more with the ARDS. Success. Go. All right, so the next question is, you decide you need to intervene and better support Mr. Jane's oxygenation and breathe. Then I suggest intubation and mechanical ventilation what is the, uh, your best response? So are you going to tell the nurse, hand me the angoscope, there is no time for sedation, or you 
tell the nurse, let us try something less invasive, such as high flow oxygen therapy first, which helps with oxygenation and may, may, may improve uh, his rapid breathing. Or, or you will say, please set up the BiPAP. I think he's uh, retaining carbon dioxide. Or maybe you will choose, I will be in my office, call me if he stops to breathe. <laughs> Which one are you going to go for? B. Any other answer from the audience? B. Any other answer? So from the pool, we're having B, right? Which is being 88%. Uh, we are having C, which is six, uh, A, 6%. And actually, I think these answers are really good. <laughs> yeah, I think these answers are fine. <laughs> so, so um, although intubation is not an unreasonable thing, the patient's, a, remember, he's awake speaking to you in three to four word sentences. So intubating him without sedation is probably not going to go very well. So um, the, the thing that you can do is try high flow oxygen therapy if it's available in your setting. Um, CPAP or non-invasive positive pressure ventilation um, is not a great option in this patient because he has no problems with carbon dioxide. He has what is called a type one or hypoxemic respiratory failure. So CPAP and uh, doesn't help with that. Okay, let's keep going. Sure. Pardon? The answer is try high flow oxygen therapy. All right, so now let us go through uh, some options we've got for respiratory support, especially when you are trying um, to use oxygen, like less invasive thing. So the first step you should ask yourself, uh, my patient is having respiratory failure, but then uh, is it hypoxic? Is my patient having uh, difficulty to breathe associated with, um, with uh, low saturation? Or is my patient um, having uh, both uh, uh, respiratory failure with uh, accumulation of CO2 problems with ventilation? Then from there, if you, you have a patient who is um, having a respiratory failure with hypoxia, you've got down here on the left side, uh, several um, options you, you, you may use depending on how your patient uh, is classified. So suppose your patient is having mild respiratory distress, then you, you are probably allowed to use the nasal cannula and it's well tolerated, uh, but then you will have to use um, low, uh, low pro oxygen and it will be providing, um, so the uh, pro oxygen maybe one to six liter per minute, and this will uh, be giving between 25 to 50% of FiO2. And then maybe uh, if you are having moderate to severe, so you can still use a simple facial mask, uh, which will give you a moderate flow from five to 10 again, with uh, um, ability to provide FiO2 of between 40 to 60%. So, um, so if you are having you you are classifying your patient as a severe respiratory distress, um, maybe you you need to move to the reservoir uh, mask, which will provide high oxygen flow. And for that, you need really to 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 move to like fifteen liters, uh, and this will allow you to provide uh, between sixty to ninety percent of if I were to your patient. So um, if your patient is, is you know, the respiratory uh, failure is becoming very serious, maybe that's where you need to, know, to use a, a nasal high flow oxygen. Um, then you should be, for here, you should be concerned about widespread use um, with uh, hospital oxygen supply. So which means if you, 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 you should be, um, uh, sure about your the, the source of your, your oxygen. And this one can provide up um, to 100% of FiO2. Uh, again, for here, for severe cases, you can uh, also choose to use uh, CPAP, depending on what, what you think your patient is going to, to tolerate or to benefit from. 
Uh, this will uh, help you to increase the gas exchange, but patient may not tolerate. So from here, your patient maybe will need sedation or maybe cannot tolerate. So you will choose accordingly. Oh, Anna. Thank you, Francois. So one of the things about CPAP is it can increase the amount of oxygen that's delivered simply because it puts a seal on the patient's face, but it oftentimes makes it more difficult for them to breathe. So if they're not tolerating CPAP um, and you think you're starting to think about sedating the patient because they're not tolerating it, you need to move quickly to intubation at that. Um, and oftentimes, I would say most of the time, if we go from a non-rebreather to the um, high-flow oxygen therapy and they fail high-flow oxygen therapy, we just go straight to intubation. There's very few people that actually try CPAP at that time. Okay, so this gives you an example of how to escalate oxygen therapy in somebody who's having hypoxic respiratory uh, failure. And then the thing on the right with the, the orange box is all about type two. And type two is when you start to retain carbon dioxide. So patients that are at risk for retention of carbon dioxide are patients with COPD or emphysema. That's not Mr. G. He doesn't have any past medical history. So he's pure type one hypoxemic respiratory failure. Okay, so we can move on. Thanks, Anna. Thank you so much. So this takes us to the following um, recommendation 47 for adults with sepsis uh, induced hypoxemic respiratory failure. We suggest the use of high flow nasal oxygen over non invasive ventilation. So high flow nasal cannula is a non invasive high concentrated oxygen delivery interface that confers uh, warming and humidification, high flow rate to better match patient demand, washout of nasopharyngeal dead space and modest positive airway pressure effect. The single, the single inspiratory limb of high flow nasal cannula allows for air flows as high as 60 liters per minute to achieve inspired oxygen fraction as high as 95 uh, to 100%. However, Anna? <laughs> high flow nasal cannula is less effective at reducing the work of breathing and supplying moderate or higher levels of PEEP. So it's a theoretic application of positive end expiratory pressure or PEEP, which is unmeasurable. We don't know how much PEEP it can, it can apply. So you can use non-invasive ventilation. Again, this is the tight fitting mask. It's, it's BiPAP and CPAP, um, but it's associated with complications because it applies high pressures. You can have gastric insufflation, which may increase your risk of emesis. Um, so aspiration, facial skin breakdown, excessive high tidal volumes, as well as patient discomfort. So again, although non-invasive ventilation with a, a tight fitting mask is an option, most of us skip it because um, it's not very well tolerated. Um, the benefits of a trial of high flow nasal cannula for sepsis patient and non-hypercapnic progressive hypoxia um, over the mask, non-invasive ventilation seems justified. Patients requiring high flow oxygen are at high risk of requiring intubation. So this is why we say if we start high flow oxygen therapy and they're not doing well, we actually move quickly to intubation. So number 48 says there's insufficient evidence to make a recommendation on the use of non-invasive ventilation in comparison to invasive ventilation. Okay, we can skip the next uh, quote. And we can do the case update, which will come from Drs. Uh, Helena and Christina. All right, thank you, Dr. Anna. Um, so for our case update, you successfully placed Mr. G on high flow oxygen therapy uh, 20 minutes ago. Now the nurse is calling you again and states, doctor, the patient is not waking up and his oxygen is low. You rush to the bedside to meet the nurse and successfully intubate the patient using a rapid sequence induction technique. 
Mr. G is now on mechanical ventilation and sedated using infusions of midazolam and hydromorphone. So the question we have for you guys is what parameter settings will you program on the mechanical ventilator? Okay, we'll do it one at a time. What mode, what mode ventilation, ventilation would you choose? Your options your options are, are spontaneous, spontaneous, passive, passive support, pressure support, AC, AC DC, and SIMV plus pressure support. Raise your hand if you have an answer. I think um, I'm not sure if it's been. So I think SIMV mode is a, it's a control mode, meaning the ventilator is mandatorily giving a certain number of breaths to the patient. I think that's a completely reasonable choice. I think assist control is also a reasonable choice. So either one of those modes is appropriate as long as the rest of your parameters are present appropriately. So what tidal volume, what respiratory rate, what FiO2 and what peak would you give? Tidal volume. Mm -hmm. Four to six cc's per kg. Actual body weight, predicted body weight, ideal body weight. What respiratory rate would you set? Ten? Who votes for ten? No votes for ten. Fifteen. Who votes for fifteen? Who votes for twenty? Okay, three votes for 20. How about 25? Diego, do you remember what respiratory rate he had? It was close to 30 breaths per minute. That's right. So you want to match what the patient was doing before they were intubated. The patient's breathing in the high 20s to low 30s because he's in septic shock. He has a metabolic acidosis from shock. So he's trying to compensate by be breathing quickly. If you put him on the ventilator and then do 10 to 15 breaths per minute, you're going to make the acidosis worse. So you want to match the patient's effort. Thank you. FiO2? I'd start with 100% and then I would start to wean it down when I was able to based on SPO2. You can start at 100. Yeah. How about PEEP? Do you guys want to add any PEEP? How many people vote for zero? How many people vote for four? How many people vote for eight? Okay, a couple votes for eight. How about 12? Okay, we're gonna talk more about P. Okay, we can move on to the next part. It's on your computer right now. Yeah, yeah, so to go and get the kick off.
um, care pocket card. It's something that is a free uh, available card for all of you. Um, and it has very uh, detailed, but very concise uh, concepts that we frequently visit in the intensive care unit when we have mechanically ventilated patients. Um, in just a couple of slides here, we'll also talk about our ARDSNET uh, keep FiO2 ladder, but um, this is a very useful resource. So I would encourage all of you um, to download this into something that you can carry on your phone or even print it out as a pocket reference um, to have. So the next uh, next question uh, we need to answer with true or false. Uh, the LRDS can be diagnosed without arterial blood gases. Wow. <laughs> can diagnose? We can see that we can diagnose. We can diagnose LRDS without uh, arterial blood gases. We review this um, Kigali modification criteria. Uh, it was a study done in Rwanda with uh, three authors of the research was from Rwanda. Uh, based on timing, there is no difference to vary the criteria uh, where the timing is within one week with no clinical insert or new or worsening of respiratory symptom. Uh, on oxygenation, there is a difference where PAO2 repressed by saturation in Kigali modification and hypoxic ratio we consider a DS if it's greater than or equal 315. Uh, on PIP requirement in Kigali modification, there is no PIP requirement. Uh, for imaging uh, in Kigali modification, uh, we consider ultrasound as in our setting most of the time there is no the CT scan is broken. So we can be consider ultrasound uh, uh, in case of CT scan. Uh, other on origin of edema is the same. Uh, we is a respiratory failure, which was not fully explained by cardiac failure or free overload. And to exclude hydrostatic edema if there is no risk factor present. Uh, that is was the Kigali modification, which helped us to diagnose uh, RDF uh, in our limited resources. Okay, we're going to have a problem with the projector, so give us just uh, less than a minute. Okay, so the remote, for the remote learners, just give us one minute. We're having a difficulty with the projection, so just one minute. Okay, we can continue. Volume control with a tidal volume of 450 milliliters. Respiratory rate of 28, FiO2 of 0.5 with a peak of eight centimeters water. Mr. G remains stable on the mechanical ventilator for 24 hours. Uh, his heart rate and blood pressure are stable on noradrenaline and vasopressin. His SpO2 ranges between 94, uh, 92 to 94 percent, and he remains on sedative infusions. His SpO2 FiO2 ratio is calculated as 184, so he's determined to ha likely have moderate ARDS. Two hours later, the FiO2 is increased from 0.5 to 0.9 to keep his SpO2 greater than 92%. And now you conclude that Mr. G likely has severe ARDS. The peak inspiratory pressure is measured as 38. Can we go up a little bit, Odie? 
So we have here uh, uh, recommendation 50 um, is that for adults with sepsis induced severe ARDS, the recommendation is using 30 centimeter water as the upper limit goal for plateau pressure over using a higher plateau pressures with the idea of trying to minimize uh, barotrauma on RLVOI. So the next question is true or false? The plateau pressure can be measured in spontaneously breathing patients. Anybody who can take a gander here. Is that true or false? Oh, we have a tie. <laughs> okay, so the answer is false. Um, a plateau pressure uh, requires an inspiratory hold. It's a static measure that we use on the ventilator. So if a patient is breathing spontaneously during that hold, the, the pressures don't reflect a plateau pressure. Um, it requires basically for the patient to be apneic. Um, it's a measure of the alveoli. Um, at the kind of end of uh, the inspiratory phase. Okay, so next question. Mr. G's parameters are set with an FiO2 of 0.9 and the peak at eight centimeter water. The peak inspiratory pressure is now 38 and his SpO2 is 92%. Which of the following statements is the most appropriate in management of Mr. G? A, the PEEP should be decreased to zero in order to decrease the plateau pressure. B, the PEEP should be increased in order to decrease the FiO2. C, the tidal volume should be increased to eight kilograms, uh, eight milliliters per kilogram. Or D, the respiratory rate should be increased to 38. I see a lot of the online audience thinking here. Anybody in the live audience here want to take a guess? Just shout it out. B? B. I hear B. All right, B is the correct answer. So the PEEP should be increased. And the idea here is that you're trying to prevent the alveolar, alveolar collapse, especially at the end of expiration. This way we're reducing the um, uh, injurious alveolar shear stresses. And ultimately we're trying to improve the ventilation perfusion matching so that we can uh, improve arterial oxygenation. So we want to increase the, the PEEP. Um, so I wanted to just bring quick attention if we can zoom into the ARDS ladder. Um, at this, uh, in this little card, we have the ARDSnet um, FiO2 to PEEP ladder. Uh, hopefully this is something familiar From to the you. the second page to you. at the bottom, it's a table. Under lung protective, protective ventilation. It's okay, Alana can hear me. So it's in the- PEEP and FiO2 at the bottom. There you go, down. PEEP and FiO2. A little bit to the left. Oh, perfect, thank you. So as we just discussed, we don't actually have great guidelines on what to titrate the FiO2 to be in ARDS. However, greater than 90% is usually um, a good goal, especially when we are having trouble with ventilation. So this ladder actually provides us with good guidelines for how we can um, escalate or de-escalate our PEEP and FiO2 titration. So that if you are to increase, for example, the parameter in one, if the if, in FiO2, then perhaps you can go down on the uh, PEEP to a certain range. And we have a high and low PEEP value here, but as you can see here, we have a very nice little layout of um, what we can titrate our goals to be in terms of the PaO2 or the SpO2 um, 
Uh, and uh, this could be a really useful guideline for us, especially when we're, we're having uh, challenges with, with oxygenation. So for this patient specifically, Okay, so for, for this, Mr. G specifically, um, even though our SPO2 guidelines say we can go as low as an SPO2 of 88%, remember that Mr. G is in septic shock. So we may want to try to get the, um, the SPO2 a bit higher. And again, I want to just reiterate the recommendation. Okay, we can go ahead and read the next question. Okay. So true or false, for patients without ARDS, tidal volumes should ex exceed six to eight mils per kilo. In patients without ARDS, tidal volumes should exceed six to eight, Tr true or false. <laughs> you have a patient that has respiratory failure and you intubate them and place them on mechanical ventilation, is it okay to put a tidal volume of nine cc's per kg or 10 milliliters per kilogram of ideal body weight? So for patients without ARDS, tidal volumes should exceed six to eight milliliters per kilogram, true or false? <laughs> Perfect. The answer is false. Right, and that is consistent with the recommendation 52 that for adults with substance induced respiratory failure without ARDS, using low tidal volumes or lung, protect, lung protective ventilation is still recommended over higher tidal volumes. Scroll down here. Um, so we're just briefly going to talk about um, how we can recruit patients safely, recruit their, their lungs safely. Um, so the idea of recruitment maneuvers is by temporarily raising transpulmonary pressures, we may facilitate the opening of atelectatic alveoli to permit gas exchange. However, when we are doing this, we are putting the patient's lungs at risk of over distending their lungs. That leads to ventilator induced lung injury. Um, and this could in, it also induce um, hemodynamic instability with hypotension by decreasing preload. And so um, when we're thinking about recruitment maneuvers, the traditional recruitment maneuver usually consists of the application of continuous positive airway pressure of about 30 um, to 40 centimeters water for about 30 to 40 seconds, which we do commonly in the operating room, um, but we can do the same thing at bedside in the intensive care unit. Um, and this, um, in, in some patients with severe hypoxemia who are hemodynamically unstable, um, recruitment maneuvers um, that uh, use interval increase in P um, may be more stable for them, but um, but in general, um, we the recommendation is that we use the traditional recruitment maneuver over the interval increase in P to prevent barotrauma. So we can go to the next question. There we go. All right. Um, I'll go ahead and talk about uh, prone positioning for the management of ARDS. Um, in general, proning has been shown to help uh, improve hypoxemia um, in these patients. Um, things we need to know are when should it be used, in which patients, and how is it done? If we click on the question there, a, a paper should pop up.
actually not. Oh, here it is. Um, this was a paper that came out in 2013. Um, it sh showed that proning in severe ARDS uh, improved mortality. Um, in the methods section of this paper, it discussed uh, proning patients for at least 16 hours a day. So we can go back to our main screen. So I just want to point out one thing, if I may. The, the publication of this paper was in 2013, which was way before the pandemic. So we've actually known for a long time that prone positioning can help patients. Which patients does it help? Patients with severe ARDS. Once you prone the patient, for how long should you prone them? 16 hours. So that's that's what the, the paper told us. And that was back in 2013. So we saw a lot more use of prone positioning with the pandemic, but we've actually known for a long time that it's beneficial. Well done. And so recommendation number 55 is that for adults with sepsis induced moderate severe ARDS, we recommend using prone ventilation um, for more than 12 hours daily. And our guideline quote is that in patients with ARDS and a PaO2 to FiO2 ratio of less than 200, the use of prone compared with supine positioning within the first 36 hours of intubation when performed for more than 12 hours a day showed improved survival. So we can keep scrolling down. Um, this next slide uh, is a checklist um, made by the Intensive Care Society. And it is on. Uh, so back up a little to that other slide with the red, green, yellow. Keep scroll up again, OG. It's oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, so for this checklist uh, uh, that again the Intensive Care Society created. Um, it goes over preparing any patient for proning, and we encourage everyone to adapt this to their setting. And the checklist includes things to consider before the procedure, during timeout, um, and during signout. Um, uh, so really optimizes the safety for a patient um, who you are preparing for. We encourage everyone to, to read through this adapted to your intensive care um, and we also include a video or a, a video is included um, below it's about a five minute long video that just goes over uh, uh, proning and how that uh, how that looks how many of you in the live audience have placed a patient in prone position before the show of hands one, okay. Do you think it's easy or difficult? <laughs> difficult. I can see the fear in all of your eyes. Like how would I prone an ICU patient with, what are the considerations? Endotracheal tubes, IV lines, Foley catheters, feeding tubes, et cetera. But these, these types of checklists make it easier to keep the patient safe during prone positioning, okay? How many people do you need to be at the bedside to place a patient in prone position? One? No. You need about four to six people all working together. So when you start to have four to six people working together, do you need good communication or can you do it in silence? <laughs> <laughs> you need good communication, don't you? So these types of timeouts and checklists can be really, really important for keeping patients safe. And I know it's scary and it's sometimes difficult to do this, but when we know that it can improve mortality in a patient, it's certainly something that we should be trying to do for these severe ARDS patients, isn't it? Right, I'm gonna move along and we've got a case update now. So uh, Mr. G has severe ARDS. He is sedated. 
we have increased the PEEP to 20 and the FAO2 is now down to 60%. You measure a plateau pressure and it is 36 centimeters of water. You remember the goal of plateau pressure should be less than 30. So a question we have uh, for the audience and for online is which one of the following strategies can be used to decrease the plateau pressure? Can you deepen sedation, decrease tidal volume from six to four, administer a neuromuscular blocking agent or all of the above? Raise your hand. Or you can even shout it out. What's your answer? <laughs> See everyone shy about speaking. She's e. I like it. Who else? Any other answers? Okay. It seems that the in-person audience and our remote learners agree the answer is E. I mean D. Yeah. I'm so sorry. My fault. Excellent. Very good. Uh, yeah, so yes, the answer is D, all, all of the above. Um, all can be strategies used to decrease the plateau pressure. So uh, our recommendation number 56 for adults with sepsis induced moderate to severe arts, we suggest using intermittent uh, NMBA boluses. Um, over an MBA continuous infusion. All right, we can go ahead and move on. Um, to briefly discuss uh, ECMO. Uh, again, this is something that uh, is not available in um, many settings. Um, uh, BV ECMO. ECMO. There it is. Uh, BV ECMO or venovenous ECMO. ECMO stands for extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. Um, is kind of a last line management uh, for patients with severe ARDS who are not oxygenating well. Um, the recommendation uh, with regards to VV ECMO is that for, for adults with sepsis induced severe ARDS, we suggest using VV ECMO when conventional mechanical ventilation fails and experienced uh, centers with the infrastructure in place to support its use. Um, how many do you have in the ECMO or used ECMO? ECMO or used ECMO? ECMO or used ECMO? How is that our person? Chat box. Yes or no? Have you used ECMO? Yes or no in the chat box. Have you used ECMO? As well, so um, it's uh, and it, it's expensive. Um, it doesn't always work. Um, so, so yeah, prevention even, is the best strategy. Yeah. <laughs> even even in my setting, I work at a different hospital. When I do intensive care medicine, we don't have that. Okay, so it's not an expectation. It's something that is available. Maybe one day it will come to my hospital and your hospital, but it's not widely available. So that's a good question that I would like to throw back to doctors, Helen and Christina. What, what kind of outcomes have you seen when you have patients on ECMO? Are these patients, especially the ARDS patients on VV ECMO, um, as Dr. Collins said, this is a last resort for refractory severe ARDS, um, and patients who are on ECMO uh, are comorbid accomplishments from the actual circuitry itself. Patients are really happy, end up stroking, they end up bleeding. Um, this is usually a 
to allow the lungs and lung transplant population and lung transplant population in general, um, they don't fare very well. Um, most of the time within five years, their new lung transplants end up failing. So, um, and that is off topic about this, but in general, these VV ECMO or ECMO in general is very costly and it's just, it's, it's really difficult to care for these patients um, day in, day out that have to sometimes be so used for weeks. ECMO is around 30,000 USD 30, per day. Yeah. I can't even count that high. <laughs> Um, so those are those are our main concerns with regards to ECMO. Um, we can go ahead and move along. Dr. Lee and Doris. Please, Dr. Lee and Dr. Uh... Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Now we're going to review additional therapies. Uh, the main objective of the next talk is to know the, uh, when to consider uh, corticosteroid in septic shock. Describe when blood purification techniques are indicated in sepsis and septic shock. Understand when blood transfusion are indicated in septic shock. Describe when IV immunoglobin are indicated in septic shock. List the risk factors to stress ulcers. Recite the recommendation regarding pharmacologic and mechanical VTE prophylaxis for patients in septic shock. List the target blood glucose range for critically ill septic patients. Understand when to use vitamin C in septic patients. Any talk? And to initiate bicarbonate therapy in appropriate clinical context. Put one mask off. And then we have to recite when to start anterior nutrition in patients with septic shock. Again, these guidelines should be uh, followed uh, in our daily practice. We should try to incorporate them. Uh, now let's see how Mr. G is doing. So you return to work uh, the following day and Mr. G is now in supine position after being in front for 16 hours. On neuro exam, he sedated on midazolam and hydromorphone. He has received intermittent bolus of cystracria monitored for a goal of two hours out of four twitches on a nerve stimulator. On respiratory exam, respiratory system exam, he has caused bilateral breath sounds. He's on ACVC on tidal volume of uh, six mils per kg, respiratory rate of 35. PIP of 20 and effort of 60%. His PIP is 35 with a plateau pressure of 30. SPO2 is 94. SPO2 FIO2 ratio is 157. Uh, on cardiovascular exam, his heart rate is 108. He has an AI that shows a blood pressure of 90 over 46. He's on noradrenaline infusion at 0 0.67. Max per kg, uh, which makes it 53 microgram per minute. He's on vasopressin infusion at 0 0.04 units per minute. On the line and tubes, uh, he has a folic catheter 
a gastric gut tube, a nitty tube, a nail line, a CVC, and a PIV2 peripheral IV line. On the recent labs, he has a white count of 27, HB of 8, a platelet count of 280, with a sodium of 147, potassium of 4.9, chloride of 110, CO2 of 16, urea of 35, creatinine of 220, glucose level of 240 milligrams per deciliter and the lactate of 3.5. Now let's get some questions from Doris. Yeah, now Mr. G's map is 61. Um, I think there is a typo we have calculated 64, uh, despite two vasopressor infusions, which are not adrenaline and vasopressin. Which of the following is the next best therapy to initiate for support of this, of his blood pressure? We have around E uh, answers and uh, from the online attendees and the audience, um, take some seconds to answer to this. What are your suggestion? Yes. D. Any different idea? <coughs> yeah, so the answer is, what about the online? I can't really. D. D. So D is the right answer. Yeah, so from recommendation 58, for adults with septic shock and an ongoing requirement for vasopressor therapy, um, it suggested that using IV, to use IV corticosteroids. So the typical corticosteroids used in adults with septic shock is IV hydrocortisone with a dose of 200 milligram per day given as 50 milligram intravenously every six hours or as a continuous infusion. So it's suggested that um, this is commenced at a dose of norepinephrine or epinephrine above or equal to 25 mic microgram per kilo per minute at least four hours after initiation. So from the guidelines um, with the sepsis um, uh, 39 and 40, for adults with septic shock and inadequate mean arterial pressure levels despite norepinephrine and vasopressin, so we suggest adding epinephrine. And for adults uh, with septic shock, we suggest against using teripressin. Well, teripressin is a new drug, but it's an analog to vasopressin. It's um, a, a vasoconstrictor. It has a longer half-life compared to vasopressin. And this is a very recent drug approved in September, 2022. And Doris? So Mr. G is critically ill in septic shock and with ARDS. He is on high settings on a mechanical ventilator and is firing three vasopressor drips. Mr. G has a hemoglobin value of eight. The student asks him, why don't you give him a blood transfusion? Will that not increase both his oxygenation and his blood pressure? So, you transfuse Mr. G. Audience, let's see first from online responders. Any answer? You see some yes, some no. Aha, it looks like answers are diverse. Let's hear from people here. What will you do? Anyone? Who says yes? Raise your hand. Who says no? Raise your hand for yes. We have one yes, and we have a big. Some, some people are saying yes, but not raising their hand. 
<laughs> it looks like they need the recommendation. Yes. So the recommendation is no. Uh, for other patients with sepsis and septic shock, we recommend using a restrictive transfusion strategy. A restrictive strategy was determined likely beneficial with regard to resource required, cost effectiveness, and health equity consideration. A restrictive strategy is feasible in low and middle income countries, and the two 2016 strong recommendation favoring a restrictive strategy is unchanged. However, the overall quality of evidence changed from strong to moderate. So stay tuned, but for now, let's get restrictive strategy. If, if, I, may, if I may say if something, I may this say is something. a very common very thing common that thing. we we have noticed in intensive care units in Rwanda specifically, but in other units as well. Um, we should not transfuse patients unless the hemoglobin is less than seven or unless they have active ongoing bleeding. Okay, so if somebody is hypotensive and having problems with hypoxia, you need to actually fix the volume status, cardiac output, and the oxygenation level at the lung or the heart. Giving them additional blood will not improve their outcomes. Okay. So if the hemoglobin is less than seven, then you can transfuse. The exception is if, if the patient is bleeding. If the patient is bleeding, then you probably need to transfuse them earlier. Another exception is the patient is having an ongoing cardiac event, such as an acute myocardial infarction, then your hemoglobin goal would be 10, okay? But for most patients, the hemoglobin goal is seven, okay? Giving them more blood will, one, not improve their condition. Two, there's a lot of complications with giving blood transfusions, isn't there? Okay, you can have all sorts of reactions. So you can have ABO incompatibility, you can have other transfusion reactions, you can have transfusion associated lung injury, which would be very bad for Mr. G who's suffering from ARDS. You can have transfusion associated uh, overload, circulatory overload as well. So you want to avoid blood transfusion unless it's absolutely necessary. And the magic number is seven, hemoglobin less than seven. Okay. So we've seen just in this last month, some unnecessary transfusions in ICU patients. So just be careful because you can actually cause more problems by giving blood. The other consideration, sorry, I'm taking all your time. The other consideration, does blood grow on trees? No, it's very difficult to get donated blood, isn't it? So it's a very precious resource. It's very costly. So we have to use it judiciously. We have to use it appropriately. Sorry. Uh, for, so thank you for this comment. Actually, I want to come back on this because you said that you have seen this um, abuse of blood. Yeah, it's I didn't kind, say it's abuse. Kind, no, it's kind uh, in the ICU, but actually I'm seeing it even in preoperative uh, care everywhere, in the ward, hospitalization. So really we have to think about, so the magic number is usually seven, unless there are the, those uh, associated issues as Anna said, right? Yeah, thank you. Maybe. Yeah. yeah, thanks for the good comments. Now, for each one of the following therapies, state whether it is or is not a current recommendation for adults with sepsis and septic shock, according to the 2021 guidelines. So it's a yes or no uh, question. And these are all the possibilities we can choose from. Take a few seconds to reply to this. 
So for the in-person audience, option A is polymix and B hemofusion. Raise your hand for yes. Raise your hand for no. Okay, only one hand went up and there's a lot of people here, so you must choose yes. <laughs> okay, no? Okay, more no's than yes. What about stress ulcer prophylaxis? Yes. Okay, how about no? Okay, people like yes. <laughs> Let's try IV immunoglobulins. Yes? Wow. No? Nice. Okay, people oh, like no. no. <laughs> Blood purification techniques. Yes? No? Okay, they like no. <laughs> Vitamin C, yes? Oh, the missus. How about no? <laughs> oh, that one's split. That one, that one's like maybe 50 <laughs> Well, from recommendation 59, for adults with sepsis or septic shock, we suggest against using polymixin D hemoperfusion. And there is an insufficient evidence to make a recommendation on the use of other blood purification techniques. So uh, recommendation 52, for adults with sepsis or septic shock, we suggest against intravenous immunoglobulins. Um, again, um, patient in sepsis or septic shock uh, with risk of gastrointestinal bleeding, using stress ulcer prophylaxis is um, recommended. Um, and for adults with sepsis and septic shock, um, vitamin C should not be given. Vitamin C, yes or no? Hands for yes? Yes. Oh, good. Okay, I like it. No. Okay, now let's look for the uh, DVT prophylaxis. Which one of the following is the most appropriate prophylaxis against venal thromboembolism? A, serial compression device. B, pharmacologic VTE prophylaxis. C, serial compression devices based plus pharmacologic VTE prophylaxis. D, compression stocking only. What's your answer uh, online? Looks like people need recommendation, but... Uh, majority is saying serial compression devices. So let's see from here. See? Okay. So the recommendation is B actually, uh, pharmacologic VTE prophylaxis. So let's read recommendation number 64. For adults with sepsis and septic shock, we recommend using pharmacologic VTE prophylaxis unless a contraindication to such therapy exists. And they say also sepsis or septic shock, we recommended using low molecular weight heparin, I think we commonly have Lovenox here, over unfractioned heparin for VTE prophylaxis. And recommendation number 66, for adults with sepsis or septic shock, we suggest against using mechanical VTE prophylaxis in addition to pharmacological prophylaxis over pharmacologic prophylaxis alone. In which clinical setting? So the recommendation is to use Lovenox instead of sub-Q heparin. In which clinical situation would you not do that? In which clinical situation would you want to use sub-Q heparin or unfractionated heparin instead? Okay. 
So in renal failure patients, you may want to consider using unfractionated heparin instead of lobinox because of the metabolism of the medication. Okay, so in those patients, choose unfractionated or sub-Q heparin. Right. Um, so the following we should um, answer it is true or false. Continuous renal replacement therapy demonstrates an improved mortality benefit over intermittent renal replacement therapy. What do you think? Is it true or false? Who says true? Raise your hands, don't be shy. Only one who says false. <laughs> yeah, so let's see what the recommendations are saying. So um, two systematic reviews and meta-analysis summarize the total body of evidence. They, they do not show evidence in mortality. They do not show a difference, sorry, in mortality between patients who receive continuous replacement therapy versus intermittent hemodialysis. And from the recommendation seven and 68, in adults with sepsis or septic shock and acute renal injury who require renal replacement therapy, um, it was suggested using either continuous or intermittent renal replacement therapy. And then again, in adults with sepsis or septic shock and acute renal injury or kidney injury with no definitive indications for renal replacement therapy, it suggests um, that we suggest against using renal replacement therapy. These are the recommendations. Yeah, this is a very common clinical question, and it sounds like our audience was split, both in person and remote audience, answered 50 50. So, mortality is not improved with continuous renal replacement. Intermittent dialysis is just as good as continuous dialysis. Okay. Okay, now let's. Which one of the following is the most appropriate glucose target for patients with septic shock? 300, below 300, between 144 and 180, between 110 to 144, or below 110. We, let's see, uh, responders online. Oh. I think uh, answer B, answer B is the right one, and most of the responders say that one between 144 and 180 is our target glucose level, and the recommendation 69 confirms it that for adults with sepsis and septic shock, we recommend initiating insulin therapy at a glucose level over 180 milligram per deciliter. Following initiation of an insulin therapy, a typical target blood glucose range is 144 to 180 milligram per deciliter. Nice. With the case update, now the nurse calls you with an update and new lab results. She states Mr. G has had zero urine output for 12 hours and that the arterial blood gas results are back from the lab. So this, this is the blood gas um, with the pH of 7.14, a PCO2 of 34, a bicarb of 11, a PAO of 55 and a 
gas excess of 17.4. So will you give sodium bicarbonate um, therapy? Yes or no? What do you think? I know this is a hot debate everywhere. From the online, uh, what do we have? There is a yes there. There is a yes? Yeah, there is a yes up there. Yeah, so let's see what the guy, because this is really debatable everywhere. So let us read the recommendations and get the answer from there. I'm sorry, uh, yeah. So for adults with septic shock and hypoperfusion induced lactic acidemia, we suggest against using sodium bicarbonate therapy to improve hemodynamics or to reduce vasopressor requirements. For adults with septic shock and severe metabolic acidemia and acute kidney injury with an akin score of two or three, we suggest using sodium bicarbonate therapy. So, so with that, with those two recommendations in mind, would you give Mr. G bicarbonate? Yes or no? Yes. Hands up for yes. <coughs> Hands up. Okay. Hands up for no. Okay. I think it's still a little bit split. Some people <laughs> say yes, some people say no. Um, in general, you, you will not use bicarbonate. So his pH is 7.14. That's severe metabolic acidosis, isn't it, with, with the CO2? Uh, yeah, that's AVG. Okay, with a bicarb of 11. Okay, so he has metabolic acidosis that's fairly severe. He's on multiple pressors. So the recommendation is that you don't give bicarbonate to treat hypotension. But in a patient who has severe metabolic acidosis, who also has acute kidney injury, then you would consider bicarbonate therapy. And Mr. G is now oliguric or aneuric, so has acute kidney injury. So that would be the indication for bicarbonate. Thank you. Overall, the quality of evidence is low, as Anna is saying. And the summary of judgment supported a weak recommendation against the intervention. The 2016 recommendation is essentially unchanged. However, when considering the subset of patients with septic shock, severe metabolic acidosis, and AKI, the balance of effect probably favors IV bicarbonate. A weak recommendation for the use of IV bicarbonate in this population was made. Thank you, Doris. Now, uh, let's discuss about nutrition. The recommendation uh, says that for other patients with sepsis and septic shock who can be fed anterally, we suggest early initiation of anterior nutrition ideally within 72 hours. Uh, more data about how we should feed these patients are available. This, uh, there is an article that is uh, advised on the guidelines for provision and assessment of nutrition support therapy uh, in adult critically ill patients by the Society of Critical Care. Uh, they will share the, the link to the article for further readings on nutrition in these critical patients. Yeah. Uh, now it's over to Jackson and Grace. If I may make one quick comment on nutrition in ICU patients, there's a lot of confusion in every single ICU in which I've ever worked. There's always confusion on nutrition. Do we start feedings on malnourished patients early or late? Do we start feedings on obese patients early or late? Do we use the gut or do we use TPN? 
These are all common questions. What, what residual volume is considered intolerance? These are very common questions. So I encourage all of you to access this article, which we will give to you. Um, it has every single one of those answers in it. It's very good. It's another guideline or consensus statement from professional societies. Things are for the Let's now talk about the results of the results of the patient. The objective of this uh, long term outcome and goals uh, will address array. Will address array. What are the goals of care for patients in intensive care who are critically ill? We integrate principles of variative care into caring for critically ill patients and develop and implement formalized handoff process. The recommendation says that a proportion of the incentives for setting the law has been commenced by the setting of the law the technology with patients and families of that law and infection. So, our uh, recommendation number 76 says that a proportion of the Yes, um, there is insufficient of evidence to make a recommendation to every. Okay, uh, there is insufficient evidence to make a recommendation for any specific standard criterion to try the goals of care uh, discussion. So for patients with sepsis or septic shock uh, at high risk of multi-organ failure, long-term functional sequelae and death. So some patients may accept in any involved treatment for the condition, but others may consider limitations to radiology diagnosis, invasiveness of interventions and predicted quality of life. So a discussion of goals of care and diagnosis is Essential to determine which treatments are acceptable and those interventions that are not uh, desired. In fact, for those who are working in ICU, you all know this. Because uh, when you see a patient who came in, who came in maybe with uh, uh, sepsis, now it is going to severe sepsis. And sepsis. Septic shock at the end of the day, they will have debilitating condition in after all. So, discussing with their family members and setting the goals will be uh, a good uh, projection of uh, the outcome and prognosis. So, we hand over the next talk to Protoshin and Angelic. Shock. We recommend integrating principles of palliative care into the treatment plan when appropriate to address patient and family symptom and suffering. Uh, recommendation 78 
For adult with sepsis of septic shock, we suggest against the routine formal palliative care consultation for all patients over palliative care consultation based on clinical <coughs> clinician judgment. Next. This is a principles of palliative <coughs> care. We talk a little bit, then we will do further reading ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, where we need a uh, communication setting goals. Uh, we need uh, to gen general principles of symptom diagnosis and assessment. We need pain control, uh, emotional care, social issues, spiritual and existential issues, grief and bereavement, uh, relative, including children, need of support. Uh, team caring, cl clarify or clarifying traditional rules, mutual respect, uh, staff stress and burnout. Uh, we need also to discuss on ethical issues, uh, emergence encountered in the palliative care and how they are they, they, their area deaf with, legal requirement, licensing or norms of palliative care. Uh, this, this component of principle of palliative care, we need to read our self-reading to know more about it in order to do, to practice it in our setting. Thanks, Angelique. Yeah, actually, um... can you scroll back down, Alana, please? Thank you. Yes, about the principles of palliative care, I just want to come back on one point. We tend to really be concentrated on our patients who are very sick, who need high care, and we tend to forget ourselves. Uh, stress, staff stress and burnout management is something we really have to remember especially we have some leaders in the audience. This goes mostly to the readers because if you, we don't manage this stress and burnout, you will end up by even not losing the patient only, but also using, losing the whole of your staff. Maybe this is something to think about. Uh, there are many ways to fight against. I will not go into details, but it's something we will have to come uh, back about and uh, see how to manage uh, anything else. Okay. So, uh, thank you for the good comment. So let's see the recommendations uh, eight. For adults with sepsis or septic shock, we suggest using a handoff process of critically important formation at transitions of care over no such uh, handoff processes. So here we see the importance of uh, passing uh, very important formations. Uh, to the other people who are going to care for our patients. So th there is uh, insufficient evidence to make a recommendation for the use of any specific structured handoff tool over usual handoff processes. Scroll down. So transitions of care are prone to communication errors, which have been identified as barrier to the timely detection and the management of sepsis. Improving handoff at transitions in care represents an opportunity to improve patient outcomes across the entire spectrum of sepsis care from hospitalization to return to the community. Structured handoff processes appear to result in a more complete and accurate transfer of information 
without any undesirable effects. Thus, despite the raw certainty of evidence, the panel made a weak recommendation in favor of structured handoff processes and transitions of care. Next. So here I have a question. Which one of the following is recommended support for patients and families dealing with critical illness? Uh, a, uh, have to do screening for economic support. B, have to do screening for housing, financial, spiritual support. C, have to provide a, a written and oral education about Celsius. D, have to invite the family to participate in a shared decision making. E. Oh, all of the above are correct the answers. So let's see what you can do for our patients and the relatives. From the audience, what do you think can be done for our patients? I'm hearing E. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I think you are liking E. It is so from the uh, most of us, even in us, we are choosing E, which is uh, uh, recommended. So scroll down. So uh, from eight eight second recommendation for adults with services for septic shock and their families, we recommend screening for economic and social support, including housing, nutritional, financial, and spiritual support, and make referrals where available to meet these needs. So for our patients, I, I know we do it uh, most of the time as we consult nutritionists, we consult social workers, and uh, even priests and pastors. So let's keep doing it as we would, and uh, it has an impact on patient outcomes. For eight seconds, eight thousand. Families. Hello. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but I think the online learners can no longer hear you. Something happened to your audio. I also just want to bring attention to the panelists that we only have five minutes left. Thank So, for the recommendation 83, for adults with services, service shock, and the families, we suggest offering a written and verbal services education, which includes diagnosis, treatments, and post ICU or post syndrome prior to the hospital discharge 
and in the following settings. From uh, 84 recommendation for adults with sepsis or septic shock and their families recommend the clinical team to provide the opportunity to participate in the shared decision making in the post IC and Is, is out again though. So maybe, maybe I can I can read it for you. So if you can scroll to the case update. Thank you for the case update. So two weeks back and Mr. G infusions and now and now ready to exhibit and everybody. Sorry that you anticipate his continuity improvement and the discharge from the ICU in approximately days. Protege, I'm gonna take over because for some reason your your audio isn't working. So so Mr. G has slowly recovered. He's off of pressors. He's ready to extubate from the mechanical ventilator. You tell him his family that he's going to have in, in continued improvement and discharge from the ICU in one to two days. True or false, once the patient recovers and is discharged from the ICU, your responsibilities cease. True or false? False. So everyone is saying false here. And Kigali, okay. and online, they're saying the same thing, so false. So recommendation number 85 for patients with sepsis and septic shock, we suggest using critical care transition programs compared to usual care upon transfer to the floor. So that just means you wanna help your patient transition back to the ward and then eventually home. They recommend reconciling medications at both the ICU discharge to the ward and at hospital discharge. You want to make sure your patient goes back on their normal medications after ICU. Um, they also recommend including information about the ICU stay, sepsis, related diagnoses, treatments, common impairments after sepsis, and you want to do that both written and verbal. If we think about our patients when they're in septic shock in an intensive care unit, do they know what's happening to them? No, most of the times they don't because what do we do? We sedate them because they're on mechanical ventilators and very ill. So when the patient recovers, they don't know what happened. They don't know why they're weak, why they have disability. So it's important for us to explain that to them so they know what to expect for recovery. Which of the following is not a common impairment following prolonged critical illness? Which one is not? Readmission to the hospital, physical disability, anxiety and depression, cognitive dysfunction, neuropathy and myopathy, or all of the above are associated with critical illness. Okay, both the um, in-person and remote audience <laughs> agree guessing. that all of these things happen to our patients when they're critically ill, don't they? So if a patient is sedated while they're sick and they wake up and they have all of these problems, anxiety, depression, physical disability, not able to think clearly, we need to help them transition back to the healing process, don't we? Good. Next slide next uh, is the last clinical update of Mr. G. One year later, Mr. G and his family returned to the hospital. He is ambulating independently. He works with physical therapy three times per week, and he just went back to work last week. Mr. G and his family visit the ICU, and they thank you and the entire ICU care 
ICU team for his your excellent care. Good job. You guys fixed Mr. D. Okay, wonderful. This concludes part two. Um, it also concludes the uh, remote uh, webinar. So we want to thank all of our participants that joined us on the webinar. We wish you were here in person, and we look forward to taking better care of our sepsis and septic shock patients. Francis? Thank you so much, Anna and everyone. I want, to, I want to do a special thank you to Oji and Alana who helped run the Zoom webinar. They embedded all of the questions, all of the poll questions. They helped us really um, make this as smooth as we possibly could make it for both an in-person and webinar audience. I also would love to thank our panelists. So Drs. Protegine and Angelique were a great team. Doctors Helen and Christina, Marokozi Chane, Doctors Vivek and Brendan, thank you, thank you. Grace and Jackson, rock star of Sepsis. And Lise and Doris, also rock star, superstar. And thank you to Dr. Francois. And thank you to myself. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Goodbye. 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 Yes. Goodbye. <laughs> All right.